Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, to this session about esports and games, same, same, but different, at Jack 10 2020. Very happy to have you here. And I have some experts from different parts of the world to discuss what esports uh, is like in their countries and games industries in their countries, how the industry has benefited or perhaps um, suffered from the pandemic. What are the business models? You get to know it all. So I'm very happy that I have with me from Germany. We are joined by, now I have to pronounce the name correctly, Evangelos Papathanasio. Thanks for having was me. Correct. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Evangelos is the co-founder at the Esports Player Foundation in Germany. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. Um, and next is Johannes Siagian or Joey Siagian. He's the founder of the Yaya San Gans Puti and the deputy head of the Athlete Development Association. And he's doing much more. Thank you for being with us, Joey. Joining us from Hello. Jakarta. Hi, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you. Ivan Juban, he's joining us from flooded Manila. So you also have to tell us what the situation is there. We feel so sorry for, for, for these floods and for the weather that you're experiencing there. Um, Ivan is the president and chairman of the Game Developers Association of the Philippines. Correct. So we're very happy to have you here, especially in these conditions. So why don't we start with you, Alvin? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing, what the game is, what the games, game development association of the Philippines is like, what the situation is in the Philippines. Oh um, well, uh, I've been uh, surprisingly and sometimes sadly, I, I because I I've been president of the Game Developers Association of the Philippines for a decade, so I was not the pioneer, you know, but I. I arrived at the scene at a very, very um, ideal time. You know, <clears throat> it was a time that um, a lot of the, the the formality happened. And I guess being an older gentleman, surrounded by a lot of really young people, they uh, they they took to uh, to my age and look look for leadership. And um, nobody else took the position for ten years. So we are predominantly a uh, we have a service culture in the Philippines in terms of uh, many businesses, especially in, uh, in IT. And it does cover the game industry as well. So this means we do a lot of service work. Like me, uh, predominantly, um, my business in games is art production and a lot of it. I'm one of the lucky ones who have been able to work on small titles and with small companies like PlayStation. And uh, now, uh, I'm working with a startup company called Xbox for the last six years. And uh, well, obviously along the way, I've been able to build a lot of uh, mobile games as well. And then uh, through all that experience in terms of production, international exposure, and of course, working with various government agencies to promote, you know, they, we still believe game, the game industry in the Philippines is nascent. It is still young. It has a long way to go. You know, and uh, that has been a big bulk of my work. And then eventually, as we all know, um, game development is, is here. It's, uh, it was supposed to be a $159 billion industry this year, pre-pandemic. Um, but then it rose during the pandemic. So I don't know how much it is now. And esports is a subset of that. You know, it's a competitive um, playing of video games in a professional and organized manner. And uh, luck, fortunately for me, I've been involved in that as well. So I was the national team manager uh, during the Southeast Asian Games, where in esports was first inserted in a traditional sports setting called the Southeast Asian Games. And Indonesia had the second biggest team behind the Philippines, and uh, that was <laughs> that was that was massive. I, I love the Indonesians. So we 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 are. I mean, it is the community of esports. I guess everybody was excited because that was another pioneering effort. And so we had nine out of 11 countries um, participate in teams 
And what was what is you know obviously surprising is there's really no money in this in the sea game. It's all about medals. It's all about carrying your flag. And so you know I was able to witness everything and compare you know what it is I saw in the development of the production of video games and the sales of video games. Then here comes another industry. And then this industry is very, very competitive. It's very social, very, very online. And both have, have uh, a lot of room to grow. And I'm just glad I'm, uh, I'm on the train riding it. So that's me. Mm. Thank you. Since we are in the Philippines and you've already mentioned Indonesia, Joey, would you like to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and um, the, the foundation that you've been heading? Uh, yeah, well, Yayasan Garis Puti is actually a very new foundation. We are still in the final process of getting the documents in order from the government. Uh, the COVID situation has slowed things down tremendously. Uh, we're actually a use oriented uh, organization. Our goal is to help support youth by developing the ecosystem around them. Because Indonesia has a, it doesn't really have a lot for younger people in Indonesia. Like the majority of uh, students or young adults, they spend their time between school, home, and maybe one other place, which is normally either lessons or religious based. So we're trying to help build the ecosystem around them by giving them access to things they don't have here, like maybe uh, facilities, courses, uh, events to show their talents and skills. Uh, we're also hoping to develop into providing counseling services and other support that kids need at this age group, but in Indonesia, it's not readily available. Um, I actually got into esports and gaming a bit differently than a lot of people in the field in Indonesia. So uh, I've been playing games since I was little. Uh, I grew up a, as a gamer, but uh, my main occupation outside of uh, school was actually sports. So I was in basketball and education. And around five years ago, when I was still principal at Pescade High School, we founded an, uh, an esports program. Uh, so my background with developing students and developing athletes led me to start doing develop, uh, development programs for esports players. And somehow, I'm not even sure how, I am now deputy head of the PB Esports Indonesia, which is the governing body for esports in Indonesia. And my job currently is to get the team ready to get the medals away from uh, Alvin and his team at next SEA Games. He's shaking his head. I can see him going, no, no, we're keeping the medals in the Philippines. No, but, I yeah. think Vietnam has better plans, but anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, Vietnam, Vietnam has plans. We know they do. But... Yeah, so I see esports and gaming more as a teaching tool. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the field, and I know that a lot of the stuff I have achieved in my career came because of my experiences as a gamer. But I look at esports more as a way to teach uh, students and young adults really important values and lessons about life and the things they're going to need to succeed later on. So that's what our foundation is uh, currently aiming at, and. Uh, hopefully we get there. Yeah, that um, sounds very interesting. Um, and that brings me to Evangelos from Germany, who's also heading and uh, was also the co-founder of the eSports Player Foundation. Um, how does that relate to what Joey just said and what are you doing? Yeah, it's uh, super interesting. Thanks for, for having me, uh, firstly. Um, we have a vastly different situation uh, in Germany. Um, it is, uh, the German society supports talent wherever possible and supports high achievers wherever possible. And I think that's a very good thing and a very smart thing to do for a society. So in uh, literature, there's a number of programs, both at a talent young writers level, but also for established, you know, highly uh, uh, rewarded uh, authors, there's also programs. Um, we have this in arts, we have this in music, we have this in science, in politics. There's a number of programs where high achievers and high performers uh, are supported and those who have the ability to be a high achiever one, one day because they 
serve as role models in their respective fields, right? They represent the country in the outside, um, to the outside world, but they also have um, an impact inside Germany um, to give orientation to young people to, you know, become high performers and high achievers as well. And my background is from traditional sports. I used to uh, consult a lot in football. I consulted FIFA, UEFA, Bundesliga, so the big governing bodies, also clubs like Bayern Munich. Um, and I also consulted Deutsche Sporthilfe, which is a, let's say, close to government, but independent uh, um, talent development uh, and athlete support agency um, that does this in traditional sports, in Olympic sports. So the number of programs when you're super talented, uh, um, canoe or a pole jumper, um, uh, there will be certain programs that help you to achieve like an international top class world class level and when you're at a world class level this agency helps you to you know get a transition into a, uh, a career after your professional sports career and um, my co-founder Jörg Adami has been off the board of directors of this traditional sports agency for over 10 years uh, I used to consult him and at some point we thought well, why don't we have this in esports, right? We have, our estimate is we have 34, 35 million gamers in Germany. Our estimate is that between eight and 10 million play ambitiously. So they play to win. They don't kill time at the bus stop for three minutes of cookie jam. Um, there's eight to 10 million who want to win, who want to improve, who want to get better, and who are not organized in clubs. We have a governing body, the ESBD, but there's not every player is organized there. We have few clubs for them. They, they don't have any infrastructure. They play at home. Um, and um, high achieving esports athletes are role models for them. So we founded the Esports Player Foundation um, with a mission, enable talents to live their dreams and serve as role models. And both parts of this mission are equally important to us. So we help talents that are not in an organization yet to achieve world class. We help pros that actually play on a professional level um, to mitigate against any risk that you would have from playing there because it's, it's like 0.1% of professional esports players who become millionaires, right? And most of them just struggle to make a living as professional esports players and after their career have to find some other occupation so we support both levels um, but we also want them to be role models for ambitious gamers in order to promote a healthy lifestyle um, you get better when you look at your nutrition you get better as a player when you sleep eight hours a night you get better as a player when you have a certain physical fitness and we promote all this towards ambitious gamers um, in order to create more world-class players for Germany, because these guys, um, they may have less support from the state, but when I look at like League of Legends worlds, how many Germans are on stage, when I look at uh, Counter-Strike ESL Pro Tour, uh, um, uh, the big tournaments, how many Germans are on stage, being the fifth biggest game market in the world, our share of top athletes is not big enough. Mm. Okay, well, that um, that's, sounds like a, a social responsibility that the eSports Player Foundation is playing there as well. So, as well, that's one aspect, exactly. The other aspect is create world-class players. Mm. Yeah. Um, Alvin, is something, does something like this exist in the Philippines as well? In the Philippines? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I guess yeah, we are we are very different uh, in terms of mindsets. Uh, European and Southeast Asia, we are a developing country, um, and and esports uh, is very very popular. We are actually in Southeast Asia. I do believe we were the first, and for the longest time, um, we were the largest um, esports community of active players and tournaments. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2015 and 2016, we had two major international tournaments in the country, but then it stopped happening. So um, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of activity in the Philippines in terms of esports. Um, but as uh, Evangelos mentioned, um, it's only now that we're beginning after the Sea Games or during the Sea Games that we started to promote the, the get better 
if you're if you look at your nutrition to get better because uh, we, we've you know admittedly esports grew in the philippines because of internet cafes i mean we are a country and i'm sure my friends in indonesia will understand that uh, had always had a difficult infrastructure in terms of bandwidth nationwide so a decade ago uh, to solve this problem um, people started putting up internet cafes and they were really really cheap and at one point in time i think there was 18,000 internet cafes across the countries uh, across the country and that's where the communities converged because that's the only place that people could really play competitively um, because the internet was better so here we are and uh, you know i've been to a lot of panels because everybody's curious what's the next step for the philippines you know you you're, you're all, we are always the best audience for esports. This was the time when uh, on ground activities were still in fashion, not anymore, you know. And, you know, people loved having, you know, events because we're, we're such a noisy, noisy, passionate people. Um, but beyond that, we, we never saw sustainability in terms of careers of the players. I mean, if, if my, my friend here in Germany is worried about your, your, your athletes, I'm, I'm more worried. You know, we have less job choices here. And still the, the infrastructure of internet is still, uh, is still wanting, you know? So unless that improves, game, develop, game development in the game industry will not prosper the way we envision it. And esports, you know, I don't think we can go beyond Southeast Asia in terms of competition. Yeah. If this doesn't improve as well, so you, we have a lot of things that are that are challenging us uh, right now. But uh, I'm still proud of you know the, the small things like we did, and especially during Southeast Asian Games. That's it. Okay, yeah, um, I uh, understand that esports is a subdivision of games. Is that can can it, can can we put it like that? Can we look yes, at it absolutely. Like that? Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, so um, can you tell us a little bit about the business side of games in your countries? I mean, Alvin, you mentioned a little bit, and uh, Evangelos, you also mentioned the number of players or the number of gamers, number of young people who play games, and also about which age group. I mean, the eSports Player Foundation is more for the younger people, I understand. Mm, is there also something? No, not? It, it, yeah. Of course, talents who want to become pros, it's very unlikely that me as a 48 year old, I could develop the skills to be a world class player. I yeah. try on Clash Royale <laughs> and I see my limitations. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> but I'm a competitor myself, so I need to try. Um, yeah. But of course, the topic of, of gaming and how we deal with it and deal with it responsibly is uh, something that targets the whole society. It's not only um, uh, for young people. Um, and it's, by the way, not only young people who play excessively, right? Mm -hmm. So now we get into generations that grew up as gamers. I grew up as a gamer. And if I wouldn't work so much, I would spend much more time before a screen play. So um, if you look at uh, the, the companies we work with, we have a sponsor that's a bank. And they were like insecure when they announced they get into League of Legends, how the people would, you know, within the bank, the employees would see it if they would say, are you wasting money or whatever. And everyone was like uh, euphoric. They were like, how great is that, that you chose League of Legends? And uh, when, when will you support Dota? Because suddenly all the managers, the 40 year olds are gamers, right? So um, it's, it's, it, it changes and it actually targets the whole society. Mm. Joey? Yeah, um, with gaming and esports, it's it's actually something for everybody there. Like uh, my seven and nine year old daughters right now, they play at least four or five different games actively, starting from anything from Roblox and Among Us uh, <laughs> to just very simple uh, visual based games. And 
as maybe a, like, I'm not sure if anyone else has kids at a younger age, but with my kids being in elementary school, I'm also starting to see a lot of games which are targeted at learning, like mathematics and words and history. And it's really amazing how fast the kids pick this up. Um, if, if I'm watching students play in the schools, and normally we would like, if we follow traditional education logic, games get in the way of learning. I was a principal for 10 years. I never once saw any evidence of this at all, unless it was for kids who just didn't do anything but play. But outside of that group, and that's not actually a very big group. Like people keep talking about how all these kids do is just play. That's not actually true. And the kids who find a way to balance these games, and it doesn't have to be esports titles, it's just uh, anything from puzzles to RPGs to esports titles, they actually show a significant uh, increase or difference between the, with the group that doesn't actually play. So gaming is starting to become a significant part of even day-to-day -day life now. Uh, maybe it used to be like on the way to work, we'd buy a paper at the road, read the paper, wait for the bus, get on the bus, read. But now we're just, we're playing Candy Crush or we're playing a quick Mobile Legends match. And it's starting to take the place of papers, books, magazines, TV mm -hmm. as a way to get entertainment. But it's also a way for us to learn, which mm -hmm. is like, like Evangela says, like he's 48 and he wants to play, he would find, like to find more time to play. Like I, I was spent the last hour waiting for the session to start by playing uh, the new Assassin's Creed game. It's, it's a, uh, Alvin's laughing. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. actually a really big part. And it's almost like, maybe to tie it into a bit to the theme of Frankfurt Bookmesse, it's almost like, it used to be I pick up a book, just read a quick chapter and then put it down and continue with whatever I was doing. Now it's, I turn on my, my computer, I play one mission in this game, and then continue what I was doing. It's almost the same kind of immersive experience, but with graphics and sound effects. I couldn't agree more, by the way. Um, my, my daughters are uh, uh, 17 and 19, so I went through this whole Minecraft phase, etc. And um, always struggling with a wife about the screen time that they have, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because she's like, ah, they're killing time there, it's an hour a day must be enough, etc. And I'm like, no, no, let them play more, let them play more. And um, when they get a new game, I'm like, look at what they're doing. Both our daughters are top of their class in English, right? Because they connect with international communities. Um, uh, the big one plays Red Dead Redemption, has great friends. The pandemic, uh, they had their Halloween party in Red Dead Redemption. Right? Um, 20 of them, one from India, one from the US, one from anywhere in the world uh, coming together as a group. Um, and now they start bringing this to Discord and to other channels. So they, they, they found friends there. But also when they get a new game, I'm always like, look at what they're doing. They're strategizing, they're finding flaws in the system. They're analyzing the game. How can I be successful in this game? Um, they learn to concentrate, they're super stress resistant. Um, in, in action games, um, they learn so many things that are so valuable. So I'm all for gaming. I'm, I'm all against not sleeping because of games, right? There's studies that gamers like to take two hours away from sleep to play more. Um, I know professionals in League of Legends um, who used to, you know, set the alarm to 3 a.m., play until 7, then get into bed for mother to wake them up because they didn't get enough screen time to play, right? That's not a healthy way to do it. That, that's not good. So we need also to educate the parents to be supporters of such uh, activities in esports, but also in gaming in general. There's, it's a thin line between playing too much and uh, you know, killing time and you know, taking the benefits of gaming, but we underestimate all these benefits that, that you get from, from playing games. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting that you're mentioning this because, yeah, I also feel that um, the benefits are not uh, really recognized in many parts of the world. What is it like in the Philippines? Well, this part of gaming, is that also? Uh, truthfully, you know, I, again, I've been president for 10 years and 
we do we did develop the first uh, baccalaureate degree in game development 10 years ago. And uh, as the story goes, during the, the, the introduction of the course, when it is uh, open for the first time, I was called by the school, the pioneer school, to a Saturday meeting. And I don't know why. I go, because I heard that it was oversubscribed. You know, a lot of, they opened um, 60, I think 60 slots for the first ever course in game development. Then 80 applied, <laughs> you know? So they made it 80, then 120 applied, you know? So there were, and then I was called to a meeting and I arrived on a Saturday and I was in this large auditorium and I was faced with 82 pairs of parent and child. And I go, what am I doing here? Um, Alvin, I, I was talking to the chairperson, he was my personal friend, the chairperson of the program. I go, um, the parents that are here today, they want to ask you, um, because you see, apparently they were all surprised that all their children here subscribe to the course. And it's a very expensive course. Yes, private education in the Philippines, you, I mean, that's the way to go. I mean, it's not, it's not free like in Europe. You know, we have to pay. Um, and so the parents were worried. So tell us, is there a future in gaming? Is there anything good about gaming? And this was a decade ago, my friend. And right now we're getting the same brick back uh, from esports. You know, so I, I came with a lot of confidence whenever I'm, I'm, I'm whenever I talk about this topic. So, because after after I was introduced in the program, there was a heckler. There was one parent who was very angry, and she goes, "Games, video games, do nothing but you know breed destruction in our children. They make our children violent. La 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 la. You know, there's no future there if they play all day. I go, well, one. I go." Um, you have to explain to your children that this is a game development course. Now, if you have not been able to guide your children understanding that this is not a course wherein they play games. This is a course where math is needed. Physics mastery is required. You know, this is not about playing games, it's building games. So then you have a problem. Now two, violence, all these bad things. You know, you might be right, you know, Maybe kids around the world might be getting this from video games. So why don't you, I suggest you really protect your child. Don't let your, stop letting your child play video games and do something even better. Stop your child from watching movies from Hollywood, um, various TV programs, YouTube, because you can get violence from all that media. You have to remember mm -hmm. that games, you know, it's entertainment. Now, if you do not manage the use of, of you know, of this, of video games, then you can have problems. So let me ask you, ma'am, what is your profession? Then she got stunned, you know? Well, I work overseas. Oh, so you're here on a vacation? She goes, yes. So you're not, you're not able to manage your child. So who looks at over your child at home? Well, my, my relatives, I don't, okay, see, there's, mm -hmm. there might, that might be the cause of the problem. You know, so, so that, so immediately everyone calmed down once I explained, it's all about management. Don't blame the game. Yeah. Um, I'd like to look a little bit at the game development, as you just mentioned, and the companies that uh, do the game developments. I mean, we know that many, there are many people who uh, develop their own games and then they put it on the internet and then they sell it and uh, there's not much I don't even know, um, but the, it's, it's a small company and they use the money to redevelop and so on and so forth. So that doesn't seem uh, to be a big money gainer. What is it like in Indonesia? I know there are lots of studios which are designing games. Yeah, on the design level here, there's actually a lot of talent actually. Southeast Asia has a very high ratio of creative talent, but a lot of these, uh, artists or developers don't know how to get into the market, basically. They don't know how to find employment or how to contact the big companies. So they work with a lot of studios locally. Uh, in Indonesia alone, we have anything ranging from studios with maybe five to 10 employees to some production houses, which have almost a hundred to 200. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of companies in Indonesia also outsource their work to 
big companies, big brands, be this in uh, for like AAA games or to cover one aspect of the game, like for example, maybe the art or maybe the scoring. So the components to a very robust game industry actually exist in Indonesia. It's just that we're maybe at a step at a stage where we haven't bought it all together yet. And that's something that will, I'm like for sure that will change within the next three to five years for sure. Uh, some of the studios which started early on, uh, we have a few studios that have been already in business for 10, 15 years. They're actually doing very, very well. And a lot of the smaller companies are starting to realize there's a, a, blue, a blueprint they can follow. But it's still hard to find younger, uh, younger, ki younger students, younger, younger kids who get their parents' blessing to go into this field, like I mentioned. So in Indonesia, it's, it's still a culture where family is very important. So if let's say a, a high school graduate goes to their parents and says, oh, I wanna go into game design. I wanna go into art design for games or music scoring for games. Uh, and these are all things I'm pretty sure Alvin has dealt with like over the last 10, 20 years possibly. Their parents just lose it. They're like, this is not a respectable profession. But because uh, because the esports boom in Indonesia, it's brought a lot of focus to gaming as well. So the whole ecosystem around games, not just the playing, but the production of the events, the content made from games is starting to gain legitimacy in the eyes of parents, government, schools. And it's, it's, you can feel the momentum, like going to any event based on gaming now, and you can actively feel the momentum building just based on the conversations or the sessions taking place. I really believe that Indonesia is poised for some massive gains within the next five years in all aspects of this, the gaming and creative industries as well, not just gaming. And that's going to be, I think it's just going to be an amazing period. Uh, right now we're being held back a little bit as well from infrastructure. Indonesian internet is uh, words I cannot use in public. And <laughs> Like as soon as we finish, as soon as we get that problem fixed, and I do, I do believe that the stakeholders are actively chasing after that. But once that core issue is fixed, we're going to see a lot more development coming as well, and in in the infrastructure, in the development of talent, uh, in access to courses about coding, gaming design, and in the basic understanding. Uh, I do a lot of consulting work. Where, I can, where high school students graduating consult about where to go to university and what course to go into. And the situation that Alvin mentioned before comes up 95% of the time when talking about students who want to go into design and programming for games. They don't realize it's a mass and physics intensive field. If you don't understand mass and physics, you should not even think about going into these fields. And that's just a matter of it's so new that people don't recognize it yet, but that it's, it's changing by the day. And I think in the next few years, it's gonna be a really good period for Indonesia and creative industries, gaming, technological design, IT. And I mean, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and then, I mean, there has been quite a lot of development in the creative industries in Indonesia. And we also saw, also, yeah, one, the, in the past few years at the different fairs, at the book fair, but also at other fairs, at the game uh, exhibitions and so on and so forth, um, more Indonesian companies. So that is very yeah, prom exactly. promising, yeah. What is the um, international cooperation here? So you said that there's a lot of outsourcing in the art and scoring fields um, in the game industry. Is it outsourced to Indonesian companies or is there international cooperation as well? Is it outsourced to the Philippines or India? Most often here, they, they do work for bigger companies. Like a, a lot of the studios here, they just uh, I, I don't fully understand the whole game development process. Alvin's probably more qualified on that. But uh, they just, they, they break down the different components of what they need done and just like, 
give part of it to this design studio, the music, mm -hmm. the music goes to that studio, the artwork for this character goes over there. Mm -hmm. And actually, from the ones I, from the people I've talked to, a lot of the bigger studios or the bigger companies who are outsourcing this to Indonesia are actually very careful not to give too much to one place because they don't want too much information on their overall game getting out to the market or leaking because I mean, we have to admit Indonesia has a bit of a problem with leaking information and stuff like that. Sharing. Yeah. Sharing, sharing. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, Premature sharing. Yeah, this is quite quite simple. A lot of the business is actually art related. It's mostly art uh, from Indonesia to the Philippines, and we we don't we don't really have clients like India or China because they're our competition. They are purely our competition. So no, uh, we work against them. <laughs> so definitely, when you say bigger studios, um, the major major targets um, would be North America, you know, Canada. Uh, well, if you're lucky, uh, Europe. You know, as, as uh, Evangelist said, I mean, wow, these, these Europeans, the, the population might be small, but my God, they can pay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in countries like uh, Indonesia, Indonesia is 20 million people. We, the Philippines, uh, we have 100, 900, 10 million people. We play, but we don't really pay. You know, it's only now yeah. that we're going to, to pay into the economy because, um, well, obviously, I think I give a lot of credit to esports as well. You know, they've, we've begun to accept that we have to start paying for our games, you know. So uh, I have, I've, you know, again, I've been president for 10 years. So I pretty much know the entire Southeast Asian industry. I have some very, very good friends in Indonesia. You now have an association. And I've been talking with your president, Chipto. Uh, ah, I know Chipto. Yep, 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 yep. And uh, we both agree. Um, since we've been, you know, at this game longer, uh, he fully believes also that, you know, when you look at any video game, you know, 90% of it is visual. It's yeah. art. So the business will never disappear. You look at esports, it's all visual. You know, you have a caster, but behind the caster, yeah. it's all graphics. You know, in between the shots, it's all graphics. It's, art is just growing bigger by the day. You know, esports becomes more popular. Art will be more popular. And so now it becomes a skill-based game. You know, who, who are really... Who are the really good guys? Because these guys, you know, the Europeans, Americans, they'll pay for that, you know, good kind of talent. So just between us girls, we actually are talking about um, raising the bar of uh, computer graphics education in both the Philippines and Indonesia using the same materials. Since we're doing it, and uh, we just were slowed down. We were supposed to um, roll it out nationwide this year, but then this thing called COVID happened. <laughs> so it yeah. wasn't a pause. COVID's a pain. <laughs> yeah, 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 this COVID thing, you know, for both our countries. And then Chiftu came in and he heard my story. So yes, we've been in a couple of meetings and they were going, maybe you guys have a good idea. Maybe we should do it in Indonesia as well. So uh, Evangelos, you will, you will see a lot. Actually, you'll never know it. You know, I'll have to tell you which games were made in this part of the world because we're as good as anyone else. Johannes, the, the latest game that you played, yeah. I bet part of that uh, was made in the Philippines by Ubisoft yeah. Manila. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're getting yeah, on. Arvin, uh, um, I, I didn't mention it before. Um, we are a not-for-profit as a foundation. And our owner, the, who owns the institution, is actually the German Association of the Game Industry, which was merged a few years back between the Developers Association and the Publisher and, and Hardware Association. So um, wow. in our board of directors and among our owners, as the, the Association of the Game Industry is the uh, German head of Ubisoft, uh, is the head of EA, um, etc. And this game association has done an amazing job in lobbying for games, both towards the public, but also towards politics. So in order to get programs for Germany to have more game developers and more studios, because actually you said it, you look to Canada and the US, you know, that's because there's no, besides Ubisoft, no really huge, big game studio or publisher based in Europe. Um, 
And uh, that's actually a thing that, of course, Europe thrives to change. It's, uh, we want to get on the map in this uh, area. And um, as you said, I think games, the, the whole game industry as such has such a global mindset, right? Um, it's not a national thing. If there would be a big, let's say, German studio to raise with a super cool game title, it would be an effort where part of it comes from the Philippines, part of it comes from Indonesia, part of it comes from somewhere else in the world. Um, you, you can't like sit in your own bubble and do something that's world class. It won't happen. Games, games are global. You can't. Yeah. And I loved what uh, uh, you just said with, uh, you know, your kids play Roblox and Minecraft and uh, Among Us, etc. It's the same all over the world. We yeah. don't have a German Among Us, right? Yeah, exactly. It's the same all over the world. I love this. Mm. Yeah, it is fascinating. <laughs> and really good education. Yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to... So who's making the money in this market? First and foremost, publishers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably because... second and third, also publishers. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's their intellectual property. And that's mm -hmm. the game. That's why you also yep. said uh, it's a thing with leaking information. It's an intellectual property game, yes. the whole thing. And um, yeah, yeah, if you create a game, great game mechanics, great characters that people love, worlds that people love, actually, um, it's, it's your intellectual property to exploit. Very similar, that, and that's why we're here, to, you know, movies or uh, uh, anything that comes from creative industries or, or from, from cultural industries. Um, and, and then the whole machine starts, and you have to see, like, um, if you produce a movie, right, people play, pay whatever, $10 to see it once for 90 minutes. Um, you pay maybe 60 currently uh, here for a, an Xbox or a uh, PlayStation title, but you play it 90 minutes every day for the next 12 months. Um, and, and the connection that you have to this world and how immersive it is, is completely yes. different from what you would have to a movie or to a book. So um, uh, the impact of this inter intellectual property on lives of people is much higher. And there's a lot of yeah. money to be made there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, so, but it's, is, it, is it mostly the international companies that are making the money, the international publishers, the big companies um, that are making the money, or and the smaller ones, they are well, making the money by providing the services? Money, money is, uh, is different, depends on who you're talking to. I mean, I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, we have registered studios and we're making a living. You know, suddenly now we have choices that we can, you know, suddenly claim that we're creative and actually make something, you know, online and get paid every month. You know, I've been in outsourcing for over a decade and I'm proud of what I've done. I'm proud of the titles that I've been part of. You know, I'm part of all the, like, you know, it takes like an average of two years, 2.5 years to make a AAA game and anywhere from 400, 600 people. So I'm one of those names that flash in the back, you know, after you finish your game. But my dream is to make my own. That is my dream, to make my own. That is the ultimate dream. I'm part of a larger association in the Philippines because I told you, the Philippines, we're so service-oriented. The Americans love us, you know, because you know, we speak the same way, we laugh the same jokes. But I told, you know, I tell the presidents of the, the president and the board of this industry, you know what my, my goal is? Is for some day that I will come up here and tell you goodbye, that I do not need you anymore because I've made my own. And I'm very proud of that. And they understand. They understand. That should be the dream. Make Fingers our... crossed, Alvin. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit also about piracy. I mean, we know that this is a problem in all over the world, but especially in Indonesia and in oh, yeah. the Philippines and all of Southeast Asia. How much is that eating away from the income through games? Um, it's, I don't think it's a problem anymore. No, I don't think it's a problem anymore. Because with the internet, uh, you, net, you, you have so much uh, authentication steps now that it's really, really hard to, and everything now is online. You know, um, and, and, and evangelists, you have to understand that in our part of the world, 
it's mostly mobile gaming, not PC gaming. And no. you can't fake that. Yeah. You cannot fake that. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of different now. You know, games don't come in a That was the time when, you know, piracy was high. But not anymore. You really can't fake things anymore. Our only problem is you know, paying more. But I, I believe um, as long as the economy is good, and, I, and I've seen it, you know, I, I, I review all the stats year in, year out. I mean, Indonesia is fantastic. You guys are paying a lot, man. You guys are paying a lot, especially because you have 250 billion people. You know, so <laughs> you are the darling right now, Southeast Asia, in terms of market. And we're just paid for, for our voice. <laughs> mm. It's doing really well. It's doing, I think, well. So in this, is it like that in Indonesia as well? That that's not a problem anymore? Uh, in general, for computer-based games and mobile games, yes. You can still see some attempts at console-based games. But Alvin is correct in, like, in saying that the technology currently behind it, it just makes it so much harder for this to happen. Mm. Um, like I still remember maybe five, ten years ago, you could still go to any major electronics mall and there would be multiple stores just selling copied CDs from uh, every single title. Uh, when I was still in high school, so late 90s, early 2000s, you could even get games before their release date. Mm -hmm. And it, like, I would have a game and I would have, I would have completed the game before my friends in the US even could buy it. But nowadays, it's still there, uh, depending exactly on what you're producing. Yeah. It's either a problem or not, because some of the smaller studios don't really have all that, those levels of protection on their games. But in general, it's going away. Yeah, it's mm. going away. It's really, really hard. Here's a funny story. Our, our, our first game studio was in 2001. And they were, you know, they were obviously, they're, they're upstarts. I mean, the first game studio they learned everything by themselves. They finished their first game, and they were gonna and they're gonna launch it on CDs. Can you believe they shut pretty much lost all their money because they built the game for like two and a half years or something, and they totally lost their shirt the day they announced the game. You know why? Because the next day, pirated copies of the games were all over the city already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm. That's their story. That's yeah. their story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Evangelos, I think in Germany, that's uh, not a problem anymore. No, no it's, it's, uh, it's, of course, no problem anymore. I mean, everyone who's my age and grew up with a Commodore 64 <laughs> used to have like a trillion pirated games, right? Yeah. It's, it's, that was the only way actually to really get games was copying them from one computer to another. Um, but you also have to be super careful with these statistics, how much business has been damaged by this. Yeah. Now to leak something, um, late 90s, I downloaded pirated music, but I would have never bought it. It was like I read something about an artist. I thought, ah, let's see what he does. Download an album, hate it, delete it. I wouldn't have gone into a store and would have paid like 20 euros for a CD or Deutschmarks at that point. Um, so, um, there was big damage to the creative industry through piracy. Yes, it was not as big as the companies want to make us think. And in games, it gets uh, uh, more and more complicated. We used to go backpacking to Thailand and come back with games, you know, and before the release date, I absolutely agree. Um, but uh, this, has, this has completely stopped here. I, I don't know anyone who's, who's using pirated games. Good actually. times, man, good times. Yeah. <laughs> And um, uh, uh, Ivan was just mentioning that Indonesia is the darling of Southeast Asia because of the population and the yeah. huge um, gamer, a number of gamers. Uh, what about Europe? Is Germany the darling in Europe? Are you asking me that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it oh, Greece, it's, it's, maybe? It's, no, Greece is, is, um, is similarly more a country of mobile games, because not everyone has a high performance PC and the bandwidth is not so good, etc. Um, so compared to Germany, at least. Um, 
It's hard to say. I think, um, and, and my mindset has always been EU. So uh, it's hard to think in, in mm. Germany terms uh, if it comes yeah. to that. But I think it's always the same big, it's, it's the big five in the EU who are driving all the developments. It's uh, uh, UK used to be, uh, and now it's <laughs> Germany, France, Spain, Italy, um, who are driving things in, in, mm. uh, in Europe. And then there's outsourcing to Eastern Europe, <laughs> Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, etc. Mm. Great. Okay, interesting. And um, let's have a, uh, I have a question here from um, someone in the audience asking about um, governmental, uh, how do you say, um, what does it take to get a, get a, a, a game registered and, um, in the government? What kind of bodies are necessary to be consulted? Uh, no, it depends on your the level of your IP laws in your country. If you're if you're saying that you want to protect your idea, so it would really depend on what you have in your country. Like uh, in the Philippines, um, you know, I know very well that it's so stupidly complicated to do it. <laughs> so most of us actually register in Singapore or in the U.S. Mm -hmm. where we're packet laws and intellectual property laws are, are much more straightforward. Uh, so I, I don't know how it's done in Indonesia. Mm. Uh, but I think this question also um, uh, is about um, whether you fulfill, you know, from the content side of uh, things, whether you fulfill any um, yeah, regulations or you, is the game uh, played by or or developed by the regulations in terms of content? Uh, well, you only get, uh, you know, restrictions mm. uh, of your game once you really publish it. And mostly, most of the games that are really, uh, that undergo these kind of rigid restrictions are the AAA games or the ones for consoles because they take so long to build. And, uh, you know, and you have to talk to either one, you know, the console makers. And they have a litany of rules, and you just got to obey it. You know, you just got to mm -hmm. obey it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. and, and they know how to protect their stuff. You know, they won't just allow you to put up anything in, in their environment, you know, because it's a console game. It, it, yeah. It's quite different. Mm -hmm. on, yeah, on, yeah, that's on, on PC or mobile, it's a much more open ecosystem. And the only thing I can add to this is, from a German perspective, uh, also owned by the German uh, Association of the Game Industry, um, there's an organization called USK. Um, and what they do is the age verification, or let's say the, the age rating. So whenever you publish anything in games, even if it's like a 10-minute preview on Gamescom or something like that, um, it has to run through them, they check it, and then they give it an H rating. Is it from 18 or is it from 12 or is it free mm -hmm. to play for anyone? Um, and so on the packaging or during the download, there will be a sign that says, this is for mature audiences, 16 plus, whatever, that comes from the USK. You can publish anything here without running it through them. Mm -hmm. okay. It's almost like a government agency. It's yes, like government I think agency. that was also the question. Amazing. It's not yeah. governmental. Yeah, it's quasi, quasi, yeah, it's... It, it's uh, it's a, a voluntary initiative from the game industry to not have it done by the government. Mm. And in Indonesia, what is it like there? Um, there's, there committee not really, or... there's not really a lot of regulation about it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, games and like even movies and things have ratings, but it's not really enforced at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in general, it's considered more a recommendation to parents whether or not to allow the, their children to follow it. Mm -hmm. But most parents in Indonesia don't really pay attention to things like this. So you, you easily have 10-year-olds uh, playing 18-plus games, and it's not something that parents mm -hmm. are aware of yet. Okay, and um, there's one more question about um, publishing and I mean tra traditional book publishing and um, games industry. Um, is there do, do a lot of pub uh, games publishers use stories or characters from books? Oh, quite a few, yes. Witcher three, 
<laughs> Witcher. Seven, Witcher 3. I mean, those, those were seven or nine books from Poland. Yeah, yeah, we, we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, do it all the time. Because uh, these, these I, as long as I guess the, the characters and the stories are really inspira inspirational and they're developed well for a global audience. But that's, that's one big mistake that a lot of young developers from the Philippines uh, do not understand, you know. You know, um, you know, some of us are very, very proud as independent developers, and we want to show the world Filipino culture. So we'll build a game, <laughs> but the thing we build, only Filipinos can understand. <laughs> so obviously, it fails. <laughs> so things like that, you know, you must have mm. a, again, we mentioned it earlier, games are global. Games are global. So we usually hammer that uh, in the student's head, year in and year out, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and Joey and Evangelos, what would you say to this question? I think a lot of uh, games actually do take from literature and books, uh, but also people uh, don't realize that the reverse also happens. Like if there's a good game with a very good IP, you will see action figures, you'll see books, comics, uh, animation about it you'll see fan like fan created fiction or stories so it it goes it can go both ways mm. like because in the, at the end of it and the very basic level a book and a game it's storytelling yeah and a good story a, a really good story will stand the test of time doesn't really know many borders and it will continue to almost sort of keep growing itself at like at the at, at the heart of any really successful game same as with any really successful book even fiction nonfiction, it's a good story that's what people look for they, they want to be engrossed in something where they can say at the end of the because it's a journey i consider a game at, and a book a journey at the end of the journey they want to say i my time spent in this world was well worthwhile and that ends up becoming, that's where you get the classics. That's where you get the games where 20, 30 years later, even so technology is so far ahead, people still talk about it. Mm. S same with books. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're almost at the end of the session. Um, we've come a long way from esports, and we talked about the, um, the role of esports in society and in education, but also about games and heard about the different countries, what the industry is like. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. It was a real pleasure to hear from our experts about the situation in their countries and globally. Thank um, you. Thank you for Rally. being here Thanks with for having us, us at Jack 10 2020. And I hope we will be able to see you in person next year. Yeah.